tantissimi. Bene, allora possiamo iniziare? Mi confermate? Sì. sì. Va bene, allora ringraziamo il professor sì. Jörg Leiter che si connette a questa, al nostro ciclo di conferenze di architettura, costruzione città da, dall'Università Tecnica di Berlino, quindi il Politecnico potremmo dire di Berlino. E, 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 Jörg Leiter è, 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 un, è un collega con cui noi lavoriamo, abbiamo lavorato molto sulla ricerca negli ultimi anni, eh, mh, su, sul terreno fondamentalmente della teoria del progetto e teoria dell'architettura. Abbiamo è stato invitato qui nei nostri, già nei nostri corsi dottorati, nel, nella Summer School che abbiamo fatto a settembre. E, e, mh, il professor Gleiter è a, 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 e ci ha anche invitato a, a Berlino perché eh, in, in occasione di, 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 di una serie di conferenze, di altre lezioni che abbiamo fatto lì. Eh, essendo lui eh, diciamo, il, il direttore diciamo, della, mh, del centro, come si chiama, istituto de, di, di teoria dell'architettura a, a Berlin, eh, ovviamente incrocia con noi molte, molte questioni che vanno dalla, appunto, da, dal, dal problema del rapporto tra teoria critica e pragmatismo applicato al progetto di architettura fino a toccare questioni che riguardano la filosofia vera e propria, il problema dell'estetica e, e del rapporto tra storia e progetto. Quindi eh, siamo, siamo in, in, ottime, diciamo, eh, eh, in ottima compagnia e abbiamo un, una fortissima grado di, di interazione, di comprensione reciproca, credo. Eh, quindi lascerei a, a Jörg la parola perché ci, 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 ci introduca i temi che ci vuole, di cui ci vuole parlare, che sono dal titolo, eh, direi, eh, docu documentalità e monumentalità o qualcosa del genere. Non sono sicuro del titolo della tua conferenza, Jörg, ma, se, ma mi suonano comunque familiari rispetto alle cose di cui ci occupiamo noi qui. Cui... Uh, Alessandro, grazie mille. <coughs> anche a <coughs> Giovanni, grazie per la avermi um, invitato anche a voi che avete organizzato questa Grazie a te. Una serie di, di interventi, di um, conferenze. Uh, purtroppo non posso essere uh, a Torino. Um, volevo proprio passare qualche giorno tranquilli a Torino, questa era la mia idea prima, però adesso um, questo è un altro modo di, di fare. E, Penso che possa funzionare molto bene. Um, allora, adesso um, cambio al, all'inglese. Abbiamo detto che io faccio la, um, la, la lezione in, in inglese, però dopo tutti voi potete anche fare delle domande in italiano. Um, comunque, allora, il titolo... Now I switch to English. Alessandro... Thank you, thank you, Black. So the title is Monumentality in Documentality, Architecture and Big Data. And um, as you know, documentality is of course a concept of uh, Maurizio Ferrari, uh, Ferraris, and um, <clears throat> I will uh, refer to him as one of the, as one of the bases for, for um, what I'm presenting here. So <clears throat> let me just start at a certain point. There will be also images, images, not too many though. Um, <clears throat> but since I wanted to keep it simple. So with uh, big data and artificial intelligence, the image that we have of ourselves will change and with it architecture. It would be a mistake to think that we know what man is, as if there were a clear model of man. On the contrary, the human being is characterized by openness, malleability, and plasticity. Man is formed by many forces. Two of them are the environment and architecture. Today, however, we have to recognize that there is a third force 
it is big data. Also, big data represents an environment that increasingly defines and shapes us. Arnold Gehlen, <clears throat> the German anthropologist, called the human being a deficient being, in Italiano è l'essere carente, mm -hmm. because it does not possess any special characteristics. And because man has no special qualities, man must invent tools to ensure his survival. One of these tools is architecture, with which man creates an environment that is worth living in and fit to the human needs. There is thus a special relationship between man and architecture. Both are related to each other in a mutually dynamic relationship. Architecture is, one has to hold, an essential part of the anthropological condition of mankind. Etruius had already referred to architecture as a basic anthropological condition, as a matter of fact, although he did not know about anthropology as we know it today. But he also mentioned two other tools that he placed on an equal footing with architecture. These are language and community. In his 10 books on architecture, Vitruvius tells the story that before they built houses, people first had to learn the language and then create communities. Without them, we cannot build houses. Whether though we can agree on the, on the order, first language, then community, finally architecture, is of course highly questionable. But I don't want to elaborate on this. We must rather assume a mutual, even dialectical relationship of dependence between architecture, language, and community. With the development of artificial intelligence, this relationship has been disrupted. This is because artificial intelligence must be considered part of the environment that man has created for himself. With a growing tendency, and it's important that it's a tendency, um, it directly affects him, man, and changes him reciprocally. Big data, database design, and artificial intelligence intervene in the relationship between man and architecture, language, and community. So in the following, please let me outline some of the conditions for these changes. Let me show how big data radically intervenes with architecture and changes its concept. For the time being though, in regard to big data and its application in architecture, we observe only certain tendencies that manifest themselves in different ways. What these tendencies are, how they can be classified theoretically and what this means for the anthropological condition of architecture in this case, um, this is what I would like to elaborate in the following. Hence, um, the title of my talk, it is Monumentality docu and Documentality, Architecture and Big Data. Okay, we see your your slides. Uh, yes. Copernican revolution is the first. yes, perfect, perfect. So let me start with some comments on what is going on right now. If we inquire into the anthropological foundations of architecture today, 
our focus must be on artificial intelligence and its influence on architecture. Not because of the technological dimension or the fascination for technology, but because of the anthropological side and the changes that artificial intelligence triggers in men's self image. It is important to know that with artificial intelligence, the last thing that distinguishes the human being as unique from others, especially animal forms, it is creativity. As a matter of fact, artificial intelligence is increasingly competing with human creativity. creativity. There is no doubt that what is happening here is more than dramatic. Artificial intelligence intervenes in the self-image of humans and fundamentally changes it. We are witnessing what in the history of mankind must be considered nothing less than the fourth so-called Copernican revolution. <clears throat> what is meant with the term Copernican revolution? The first Copernican revolution was triggered by the astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus, was able to show that the solar system, the stars and the planets do not revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun. Thus, man lost his position in the center of the cosmos and together with the earth, man moved into a marginal, a kind of marginal position. The second Copernican revolution is associated with Charles Darwin, who recognized that mankind does not owe its uniqueness to being created by God, but that man is related to the animal world from which he involved, evolved. And the third Copernican revolution was initiated by Sigmund Freud. Freudian psychoanalysis shattered some enlightenment convictions by showing that man is not master of himself, that the id, the unconscious, is master of the ego. And each Copernican revolution deeply shocked the worldview of man. And now, man must share the privilege of creativity with the computer, or increasingly, he has to share the privilege of creativity with the computer. This is not only, this not only bothers men's self-consciousness, it leads to a profound crisis as far as the anthropological status of the human being is concerned. Though it is a paradox, the more man knows about himself, in the world through science and research. The more he is able to change the world around him, the more he moves away from the center of the world and to the edges. And this is especially true for artificial intelligence. We are pushing ourselves to the edges even further than it in the Renaissance or in humanism happened. So by the way, when we talk about the Copernican turn, it goes far beyond the talk of the digital turn. Some theorists, you know them, like Mario Calpo, are already announcing the second digital turn, whereby digitization is still in its beginnings, and so is also artificial intelligence. But the real shock is yet to come, and this is artificial intelligence. So these repeatedly proclaimed terms, such as the digital turn, the linguistic turn, the spatial turn, and many other terms, only interpret the world differently. For, example, for in instance, the linguistic turn of the 1960s interprets the world from the perspective of science and linguistics. 
while the spatial turn interprets the world from the spatial paradigm. However, what is known as Copernican revolution reaches deeper into the human psyche and unconscious than a turn ever does. While the Copernican revolution changes the relationship of men to the world, the turns only interpret the world in a different world. And as you know from, from Karl Marx, you know, you have to change the world and not only talk about it. Well, this at the side. The Copernican revolution changes a man's consciousness and his position in the world. Galen again, the anthropologist, <coughs> in his book already foresaw this because he entitled the book like this, Man, His Nature and His Position in the World. And this is going to change. It is precisely his pos this position, man's position in the world today that is changing with artificial Let me move to the next topic. Big data, the new materiality of architecture. This is my argument here. Contrary <clears throat> to general expectations, however, the growing influence of artificial intelligence does not lead to a break with the concept of architecture. But to use a term of Frederick Jameson, to, it leads to a shift within the hierarchy of the cultural dominance, what he called the cultural dominance. There's no revolution, there's no break, but there is a shift in this web of cultural concepts and dominance. So this brings me to the central thesis. So the influence of artificial intelligence <clears throat> in architecture manifests itself in the transition from the concept of monumentality to documentality. The term documentality goes back to the philosopher Maurizio Ferraris, who you probably know him, um, I met him already. In order to transfer the concept though into architecture, however, a certain reorientation of the concept of documentality, which Ferraris named for philosophy, is necessary. Documentality in architecture manifests itself in a specific change in the documentary character of architecture and thus in a change in the materiality of architecture because documents and materials, of course, they're linked to, together. The reasons for this is, as will be argued below, lie in big data as the new materialist basis of architecture. So we have probably have to redefine what material is and means in architecture. So I would like to illustrate the significance of material and materiality for the reconceptualization of architecture in general with an example from Japanese architecture. <clears throat> it is the five-story pagoda of the Horiyuji Temple in Nara. The Horiyuji Temple is the oldest wooden building in the world, built around 680. The decisive impulse for the innovations in architecture in this case, so in the case of the Horiyuji Temple, came through the use of wrought iron nails. You see them on the right hand side. Um, <clears throat> the impulses for the innovation before came thus from a field outside architecture, other than architecture. Around 600, it was the production and the use of wrought iron nails, an avant-garde technique at that time that changed architecture. They made it possible to build a five-story pagoda of dimension unsurpassed at that time. It is significant 
that the nails, though, were applied invisibly. Had they remained visible, their presence would have interfered with the symbolic system that is with the established system of meaning, of denotations and connotations of Buddhist temples. As new elements, the nails would only have caused irritation. Only their technical function would have been recognized, but there would not have been any possibility to confer meaning to them beyond their technical appearance. This is why they were used hidden. <clears throat> For each new material and form, a semantic code must first emerge so that the new can be given a place within the existing grammar of materials and forms. In the 18th century, in the 18th century European architecture, iron was already used in many ways as reinforcements of steel to take over the tensile forces in stone constructions, as for example, in the construction of Saint Genevieve by Jacques Germain Soufflot in Paris. Like the wrought iron nails in the Horiuchi temple, this steel also remained invisible. It could not have been interpreted or been given a higher meaning beyond its material appearance, also in this case of Saint Genevieve. If it were visible, the steel would have been perceived as an ugly, let's say, an ugly disturbance because often what is not understood is called the opposite of beauty. And it's, I would say this is ugliness, ugly. Here, one aspect emerges that is fundamental to understanding architecture. Changes in the material and techn technological basis are triggered for, <coughs> triggers, sorry, triggers, um, <clears throat> will trigger also change in the language of architecture and its symbolic form. So this is also where the question of the changing conditions of architecture today must begin. Against the background of big data, we need to broaden the concept of material, just as, was, as it was the case in the transition from the traditional wood construction to the wrought iron nail in Nara about the year 600. We need to recognize big data is the new material basis for architecture. Doubtlessly, the new material of architecture today is the mass of data that is collected, analyzed, and in database design applied to architecture. The next step is <clears throat> that I like to I like to clarify the concept of monumentality. Then I will move on to deal with documentality and then use current examples to explain how, under the influence of big data, a shift today occurs from monumentality to documentality in the concept of architecture. So let's turn to monumentality. <clears throat> monumentality is one of the central concepts of architecture. It always was. Monumentality is associated with the ability of architecture to refer to ideas and things that are not present in the actual building. By means of material signs, architecture is able to refer to things that are absent, be they real or ideal. Hence, monumentality consists of the tension between materiality and sign between things present and things absent. 
One could also speak of the transcendence of the material presence of architecture through monumentality. Saint Genevieve in Paris, again, can serve as an example. For example, by means of columns, architraves, capitals, entheses and fluting and, and so on, all signs in their own right, the building refers beyond itself to ancient times and to the values that are associated with antiquity. Without these signs, the building would just refer only to itself. So this is where the document comes into the dis discussion. By means of monumentality, architecture becomes a document of something larger than itself. Monumentality thus has something to do with science and their readability and the material basis that carry the sign. In semiotics, we speak of the material as a sign carrier that gives the sign the possibility to become visible. The sign carrier in its materiality is needed for any sign to be legible, to be, be it paper or stone or any other material. This is evident, evident, for example, in the clay tablets from the Mesopotamian town of Uruk. It, it is about good 3,000 years ago. As it is very clear here from the example, the engraved signs could not exist at all without the material clay. Signs are here imprinted into the clay. Sign and material belong, belong together, they form one unit. And in architecture too, we are always dealing with material signs. For example, columns, pediments, this refers to antiquity or the classicism, but also in modernity, piloti, the famous uh, Le, Corbus, Le, Corbus, Le Corbusian uh, balconies, the ribbon windows, but also the imprints of the scarfboards on concrete walls. They document how the building was made. These are all material signs that refer to something that is not present. They document a process in architecture which is long past. One might object that there are also buildings that exhibit no or only few signs. Buildings that perhaps have smooth, untreated surfaces free of ornamentation and images such as, for example, the pyramids of Khufu or the pyramid of Cestius in Rome. Yet these buildings are not monumental in the true sense of the concept. They are simply very large. They are just big and they refer only to themselves. They are characterized by what can be described as bigness. To, to architects, the concept of bigness is well known. It was the term was coined by Rem Kohlhaas. So we have to distinguish bigness and monumentality. So let me summarize what I presented here so far. Monumentality is revealed in the fact that the material presence of architecture is transcended by symbolic references, signs, to something that is absent. Monumentality makes the building grow beyond its material physical limitations. In this way, architecture becomes an intellectual medium of the imaginary. Thus, we can maintain that monumentality short circuits two experiences, 
the present and the absent thing. So the building and where it refers to. Material and idea and thinking and sensual experience. Sensual experience is of course very closely connected to the material, the thinking more to design, but there is of course also aspects of sensual experiencing in science and vice versa. By means of monumentality, architecture grows beyond itself, it becomes an expanded, what we can call an expanded field of thought and experience. Now, let me turn to the concept of documentality, although in a very rudimentary uh, way since because of lack of time. So in times of big data, what is new in architecture lies in its changing documentary character or even at times its renunciation of it at all. This has to do with today's changing conditions of cultural production as a result of the growing storage capacities of computers. However, I would, it would be a mistake to assume that database design only concerns the structural data that are linked together in the architectural design process. Today, this I think is very important, Database design means that data are collected about also about people's emotional, psychological, and physical sensations, about their expectations and desires, which then become the basic parameters of the design process. Big data is not limited to the objective and quantifiable facts, just as material or construction and this kind of things, but also records, purchasing, consumption, leisure time behavior, mental states and emotional patterns. What unconsciously determines life can easily be analyzed by means of big data, by means of artificial intelligence, and then be turned into parameters of form and shape of the architectural object and thereby bypassing the architect. What then does documentality exactly means? By adaptation of Ferrari's concept to architecture, the concept of documentality in architecture reacts to the facts that the digital data are not visible signs, that they are no longer have any materiality since they exist, exist somewhere in the memory of computers only as digital binary codes. They are distinguished from the visible and interpretable forms in architecture, like all kinds of signs, the old ornaments or images, allegories and so on. Um, <clears throat> and by the fact that they cannot be seen, that when they are stored digitally, digitally, they exist only as unrelated information. And information is always unrelated. It's bits of knowledge, if you want so. Only when they are linked, to another or to other data, then they become meaningful because this, they enter into a relation with something. But still, they don't tell a story. And I think they aim primarily at effects. Only then is their actual, actual purpose activated. This then characterizes um, monumentality. The documentality, sorry. Documentality describes the renunciation of the documentary character of architecture, or to put it more clearly, 
a refusal of readability of architecture as a document of processes, be they past or future. The following trend can be observed in architecture today. That the architectural objects of today are increasingly generated by a wealth of data, which are less concerned with meaning than with effect. This manifests itself as a shift from the level of meaning to the level of effect, or in our terms, from monumentality to documentality of architecture. Is this the proof? So projects <clears throat> such, such as the King Power Mana Nakhon Tower in Bangkok by Ole Scheren, or the provincial headquarters in Antwerp by Xaver de Geita, aim to evoke admiration and strong emotions. They are no longer part of a grand narrative of architecture, as it was the case with Saint Genevieve, or let's say, even the Sequin building. These new buildings no longer want to justify themselves for what they come from and what they refer to. They are just there. They are purely present. And projects like the Batik by MVRDV in the Polish city of Poznan are hermetically self-contained and rely solely on large-scale effects. Style and ornaments, signs, that is the language of architecture is replaced by a technique of pattern. Ornament is turned into pattern and the semantic intellectual dimension is replaced by exclusively emotional impact. Oh, my question, can you read anything into these buildings? They are purely emotion, purely about effect. And moreover, the critical individual individuality of the architect is substituted by a collective intentionality based on big data. By the way, also the concept of documentality of uh, Maurizio Ferraris contains this element of the collective intentionality. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, this is not without precedence, as the architecture of documentality can be associated with Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of grand style. Nietzsche associated architecture with what he called the power, I quote, the power which no longer needs any proof, which burns pleasing, which does not answer lightly, that speaks of itself as a grand style." End of quote. Architecture is, as Nietzsche points out, I quote, a kind of eloquence of power in forms. End of quote. And Nietzsche's example, example quite rightly, was the Palazzo Pitti in Firenze. In this building, in the excess of enlargement of the architectural signs and stylistic elements, rustication, for example, the huge arches, they lose their meaning. They are oversimplified to the point of, I'm sorry for saying this, to the point of caricature. They are only big and aim solely at effect, almost, almost exclusively, let's say. I would not like to overdo it. <clears throat> now let, let me turn to the last <clears throat> part. Today, increasingly, big data is the source for changes in architecture. In the spirit of the fourth Copernican revolution, artificial intelligence, big data, 
database design are changing the humanistic foundations of architecture that defined architecture for a good 600 years. The basis for the humanist tradition in architecture, as we know it today, were laid in early Renaissance. It was the obli obligation to document, very important, to document architectural design in drawings and models, as demanded by Leon Battista Alberti in De Re Edificatoria, that, that radically changed the course of architecture. On a new material basis, paper, pencil, and scale drawings enabled architecture to experiment with references to other buildings or other times. On a trial basis, documentation on paper, the sketching, for example, made it possible to quote, to cite, and to collage together different styles, forms, and details of other buildings, of other architects, and other times of all that, which was not present in the room where the drafting table was of the individual architect, architects. Ultimately, the drafting table of the architect turned into a laboratory. This is the great invention of the Renaissance, not style and these kind of things, but the architect's studio as a laboratory by allowing experimentation, experimentation with the new materiality, paper, pencil, and scale drawing. And this enabled architecture to become finally an intellectual and artistic practice on the par, on the same level with the arts. Very important. One of the most eminent examples is Michelangelo's Biblioteca Laurenziana in Firenze <clears throat> and the famous Ricetto. On the one hand, Ricetto, the concept, refers to the unusual treatment of the columns standing in a wall niche that was very unconventional at the time. While conversely, on the other hand, the wall between the columns produced towards, in an unusual way, towards, um, <clears throat> towards uh, the, the spectator creating an incredible effect. So creating an effect that architecture is turned into an ambiguous and ambivalent game of formal and spatial elements. One does not anymore know exactly what is the wall, what is the pilaster, what is the column, what is left and right and so on, let's say. It's a very, very interesting um, example here. So this creates great tension between intellectually, both intellectually and sensually. This turns architecture into an intellectual as well as sensual game. With the new technique of scale drawing, architecture has become, what I already mentioned, become an expanded field for thought and experimentation. So let me go to, uh, to my let's last slide in Berlin and then I'm always um, finished. Only then in the 15th century did architecture become a cultural technique equivalent to the arts, such as painting and sculpture. In the light of the emergent humanist thought, this upgraded the role of the architect. From then on, architect architecture was reliant on the intentionality of the individual architect, that, the, that is on his intellectual and artistic skills. There's much evidence though, that with big data and, big, and database design and its collective intentionality, that this is going to change. And with it, the humanistic foundation or humanist foundation of architects, architecture 
are changing, most vividly documented in the shift from monumentality to documentality triggered by big data. One, la one last comment. Big data is to the 21st century architecture what the paper and the pencil in the early Renaissance was and the wrought iron nail was to the 7th century wooden temple architecture in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jorge. We <clears throat> cannot clap you, all of us together. It would be worth it. But uh, thank you, thank you. Because <laughs> the lecture was really, really strong and uh, very clear. I really appreciate this. And thank you also for this uh, big frame you offer us about uh, this different concept and the way you connect uh, the notion of monumentality with the documentality which opens up a huge debate. Uh, I maybe, I don't know if I have to be the first one to, to ask you something. It would be great if, uh, if the student would start and I would like to, to give them the floor immediately and, and to, to the PhD students and, and the, and the um, master student mm -hmm. mostly. Uh, if they if they have to to ask something, even if they want to get some notion clarified or repeated, mm -hmm. uh, so um, is there anyone who's want to to start with with the questions? And okay. how, what is the what is the? If you have a question that is already there, go for it, and then we will follow with the list of the student. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Hi, I'm here. Okay. Uh, the first question is uh, what, uh, sorry, one moment. What prompted you to deal with architectural theory rather than practice? Oh, okay. Was, uh, and uh, <laughs> sorry, one moment. Was your activity influenced uh, by the truth of some architect uh, in particular, such as Peter Eisman or Toyo Ito? Thank you. Oh, yes, thank you very much for the, for the question. Um, probably it has also something to do uh, what I presented here. Well, why did I <clears throat> move from architecture, from practice, from design to, to architecture theory? Well, let me say, and maybe it be, became also clear in, in, the, in the lecture that theory is also design. It's also inventive. It, it is as exciting as building a house, but maybe it's a different kind of excitement. Well, <clears throat> why did I move to, <clears throat> to architecture theory and who influenced, influenced me? Well, I think I moved to, to architecture theory because as a student and afterwards as a practicing architect, <clears throat> um, I was involved and confronted with a lot of different design methodologies. And at that time we could even say about different styles. So I <clears throat> designed, I did uh, a course with um, James Sterling then it was postmodernity. Then I took a class with Peter Eisman, and it was deconstructivism. Then I worked in the office of Joseph Paul Cleosi in Berlin, then it was rationalism. And my, <clears throat> and my master uh, work was very much, very close to Aldo Rossi. So this was my interest, these different kind of articulations. And then I found out probably that I was unable to decide for one or the other, that I was too much interested <clears throat> in how these kind of languages come about, and what they mean, how they are connected to society. And, <clears throat> and ultimately, I think it was the experience in the office of Peter Eisenman, ultimately, that, um, that somehow made me then change to theory, although I would say um, design was always a very, I, I liked it always very much, and I think I was not 
but I'm I'm successful as a designing architect. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, can can I ask a question? I am Mateus. Hi, Mateus. How are you? Hello. I'll, I switch on my camera just yes. to. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you, Jorge, for your presentation. It was very interesting as always. Um, I have uh, two questions actually. I would start maybe from, if you allow, please. If um, this, I would start from your last uh, statement, big data is today what paper and pencil were in the Renaissance mm -hmm. and steel, nail, steel nails. So my question is, uh, these two tools that you, that you mentioned, the paper and the steel nails, were part of the architect's, uh, let's say, bagaglio mm -hmm. of their tools they could use. Oh. While big data is not something that we can easily access, or, or at least today. So how does this relate to the usage, the daily usage in the practice of, uh, of the paper as a tool mm -hmm. for the design and also the seal nails for the building? Mm -hmm. So this is the first question, and it's bit, maybe a bit more practical. And the second question was more related to the idea of the monumentality that you very clearly explained before. And I was one, you said that with, monument, with monumentality, architecture becomes something else from itself because it refers and it carries signs, it refers to something else that is absent, you said. Mm -hmm. But my question is, uh, can architecture be, can it be only itself? Mm -hmm. So can, is there the possibility that architecture doesn't refer to anything else? Mm -hmm. So is there ever a situation where architecture does not refer to something or is it always monumental mm. because someone might read some signs or might read some interpretation in it so is it a two-way communication or can it just be an interpretation of, of a third person's I mean, reading <clears throat> i mean you're right of course architecture is always something which we interpret as we always interpret our the outside world uh, um, <clears throat> world perception is always a process of interpretation um, whatever we look at, um, <clears throat> how we perceive our um, the environment. But it's always about our perception and perception. It's about the thinking and the seeing, um, <clears throat> which is very important. But we can say, you know, there are maybe objects, architect, um, uh, architecture, which offers more to the intellect, to the references, uh, to to references to the, to, to the interpretation than other bad examples. For example, the pyramids, that was my example. Um, <clears throat> of course, it has no other sign than itself, what is associated somehow with this, um, with this pure form. Um, <clears throat> and therefore I would say then here, yeah, the, the sign reading is reduced, is extremely reduced in this case. Monumentality, of course, I skipped some very important parts. Monumentality has also something to do with the concept of the sublime versus the concept of beauty. The sublime, so monumentality always appeals more to the sublime as to beauty, I would say. Um, and here the emotional thing comes into, into the game. So, <clears throat> and this is where I hook up or connect with the concept of documentality, so a way of producing um, architecture which is totally based um, somehow on this hidden sign processes where there's nothing to, which do not refer to, to anything else. And this is why, and this is also I think very important, when the concept of monumentality, you have to understand it's not, well, it has to do, of course, with things that are big, but not necessarily. Also, small things can be monumental. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and this is very important to, to understand. Yeah. So monumentality is if you, for example, if you follow um, <clears throat> the concept of Semper, Gottfried Semper, it has to be, it, it must be durable. It must be big, as he says but it must ref refer to history and then, then it has to also exhibit a certain atmosphere. 
And I would say the most important aspect in these four is the historicity, that it refers to something, to a time back into a history where we almost are unable to think, to think of. So to antiquity, to Mesopotamia, to Egypt, to Rome and to um, Athens, let's say. And this was always, and this is a concept of monumentality, which is then detached from the sheer volume of a building. And I would say we have to deal with, uh, we have to conceptualize monumentality in this sense. Um, although I know that many, <clears throat> many concepts of monumentality, for example, like Gideon, Siegfried Gideon, I, he, he never considered this, but he is very close to, to somehow to a kind of popular culture, which is also, but I would not go too far in this case. The other thing is that the big data as, <clears throat> as material, big data or data, I think architecture was always parametric, um, <clears throat> but in a lesser sense than parametricism is today referring or based on big data. So it is, it is the quantity <clears throat> of, of um, information which makes the difference in the first place. And the second is in how it is processed. It is processed by a machine, by algorithms, um, <clears throat> while in the classical design process, it was processed by the human mind, by an architect, which had to somehow enter in this process of interpretation and, rela and in relating things to each other. I hope that I was able to. So, so do you do you envision this big data becoming more and more a daily tool for the practice? Well, this is now the critical part. I fear that this is probably already or more and more the case. That architecture has to somehow that there this. Of course, there's a building information modeling, um, which requires us to design or use certain tools. And um, <clears throat> I, I fear that, that there is a big part of architecture will be performed like this. And as I mentioned, that I think there is a, right now we can only talk about the tendency, but the examples which I, which I showed you from MVRDP, from the Belgian um, <clears throat> um, architect and from Ole Scheren, you know, these are architects which somehow maybe they to follow these trends or and maybe anticipate it. It might be not totally based on big data, but they already design in the mindset of big data and artificial intelligence. <clears throat> very well. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, we have Omid that wants to ask a question. Can you hear me? Oh yes, I can. Yes. Uh, hello, and thank you for your brilliant speech. Uh, I have a question regarding to your uh, one of your articles that I was reading. Uh, I wanted to know that would you please uh, describe the, the technique of uh, a flunner as a tool of uh, discovery of the city as a uh, as a landscape, mm -hmm. and uh, is this technique is still um, functional these days to discover the architecture? as a leading of the art of the current era in metropolitan cities like Turin or not? Like, uh, is it the same way that uh, maybe Nietzsche uh, in, the, in his um, age did, or we have to update it or something? Okay. Yes. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think the technique of the flaneur is a very interesting technique, but it is a technique which is less about discovering the city than about discovering oneself, one owns unconsciousness. This is very much linked to this, this concept. So also with, if you read Walter Benjamin, it is somehow the flaneur enters in a discourse with his own history, with his own subconsciousness or unconsciousness. 
Um, <clears throat> so the city is a tool. It's more a tool than the object of reflection. I think this is very important to understand also. In the case of Nietzsche, I would say it was like this, or there was, a, again, a tendency in, um, <clears throat> in his experiencing um, the city of Torino. Um, <clears throat> you know, the flaneur that it, which opens up the mind or somehow all that is hidden, the suppressed consciousness. Um, and um, <clears throat> And uh, I, I think it, it is possible today, but probably the, the kind of the outset, the conditions are, of course, changed. But if you talk about the <clears throat> anthropological constants or anthropo anthropological condition of men, the unconscious conscious is still there. We have, we have lost, lost, it's part of us. And um, maybe we de developed today there are different tools or means um, in order to unclose the unconsciousness. But the city, I think, is still a valuable thing. And it's interesting, especially in our situation right now um, <clears throat> with the quarantine or being locked out. Um, I have the feeling that when this is over, we probably will enjoy city most likely a little bit in the direction of the flaneur. Understand that the city and our moving in the city, our connection to the city um, is very important for us to uh, understand ourselves and maybe for our emotional balance. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now, now we can follow with uh, uh, the, the question from group 26 or um, 13. Ti aspetta, c'è Michele, uh, l'audio. Okay. Michele, ci sei? È vicino alla, alla camera per accenderti il microfono. In basso a sinistra. Non ti sentiamo. E hai ancora il microfono staccato, però, eh? Magari se vuoi, se, se hai difficoltà, puoi scriverci la domanda e la leggiamo noi. Ok. Allora, facciamo così e piuttosto passiamo a... Mentre Michele scrive la domanda, possiamo passare a qualcun altro che riesce a dare voce alle sue parole... E, e, e quindi poi magari Jörg in, in sequenza può rispondere all'uno e all'altro. Se dopo Michele c'è qualcun altro. Someone else is from uh, the groups, maybe? Okay. Michele ha già scritto la sua domanda. Mm -hmm. Jörg, tu puoi leggerla? Um, nella, nella chat? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you read it? If you go down in the, the lowest... Okay, yeah. Okay. Now he says, nowadays we can say that our society conceives machine as a mean to maximize the results of minimizing the efforts. According to the fact that machine is now present in almost every activity, also in that of the architect, what consequences does this increasingly close relationship have on the role of the architect and on his work. Okay, yes, I think I referred to this also partly that, um, <clears throat> that with big data, with artificial intelligence, um, of course, the architect will have a problem. And, um, <clears throat> and um, the question is how to balance this. I would not 
predict that the, that the architect disappears. I think this would be, it would be it wouldn't just feel right. Um, or on the contrary, we need the architect, but the architect needs to that the relationship between the machine, the computer, and the processes, which is also very important, and the coordination, so the processes of participation. Um, <clears throat> here, I think the architect has to interfere and one has to come up with a model that, um, <clears throat> that helps somehow to, to guarantee the quality of architecture when the machine, let's say, is taking over. Yeah? So we should not let the machine taking over. Um, <clears throat> and this is the big problem with the BIM and we have to study this and we have to look for ways how we can introduce the human factor, you know, the humanistic um, <clears throat> and the anthropological um, um, basis into the machine, if you want. So it is a more metaphor, I, I guess. Um, so the relation changes, and I think it's not anymore the, the same machines because, you know, my laptop, nothing moves. There's no, nothing, yeah, it's, it's not a classical machine. It's not an analog machine. So with the changing, of, um, concept of machine, of course, architects have to adapt to it, but I see no, 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 how can I say, um, why shouldn't architects be able to adapt to it? I think it will be one important, one of the important issues in education, somehow the question how we deal with the computer um, <clears throat> and its interference, and especially not only the computer, but with artificial intelligence. Just imagine that there will be a time, and I'm, I'm quite sure that building a house will be an easy, an easy game because the machine will do everything. And you can change a little bit the parameters, do it a little bit, this style, this style, will be all possible, why not? But the question is whether this is architecture, whether this is only uh, a building a, an object and how some are especially the human factor, so the human quality, anthropological um, <clears throat> um, qualities, how they um, then are uh, introduced into, into, this, um, <clears throat> into, into these processes. That was my answer. Is it okay? Yes, great. <laughs> and yeah, we ask uh, still to the um, students from the two groups if uh, they have uh, other questions. Hi, do you hear me? Hi, yes, I hear you. Thank you. Okay, I am Luciana. Hello. You, Luciana. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, According to you, the design process uh, could be shortened uh, thanks to the use of big data. And uh, the second is uh, always according to you, big data could help uh, architects uh, to understand and handle with the post-emergency situation. Well, the, we don't know exactly what a post-emergency situation will look like. I think nobody has an idea what is going to hap happen. <clears throat> um, but the post-emergency situation will be the worst case scenario that we can imagine. Um, we don't. And I think it, then it's actually we need um, people who decide and not machines that take over. To solve these problems, we need smart politicians, good scientists, and um, an understanding populace, let's say, or people. Um, but it will be, um, but I think the process with artificial intelligence, the development of um, artificial intelligence, I think this will go on definitely. Um, there's no, it's no holding up these processes. And I think um, <clears throat> the vi virus will change something, but um, I think not in, in in this regard. Um, and then, as I already mentioned before, I was talking about certain tendencies, 
but maybe it is at the same time it's more than tendencies because it's there are already evidences of um, let's say artificial intelligence working in the production sector in um, <clears throat> autonomous driving and these kind of things there's an evidence but I think it's not still not arrived, uh, but we are close to it. And this was my argument that, for example, also with the Copernican revolution, you know afterwards that it was the, uh, a revolution, that things change. So there's a, also when, let's say, you know, psychoanalysis did not fall from heaven in, nine, in the year um, 1900. But it was prepared by a long period. A lot of people participated, psychiatrists, psychologists participated. And then Sigmund Freud, of course, was the genius to come up with this idea. And the same thing is also today, because we are already somehow in the process. Um, <clears throat> but there's not, you know, it's not like, um, I don't know, it's not changing from one day or two to the other day, but we are in the process and um, <clears throat> well, and then in retrospect, we can maybe pin down somehow more, more clearly uh, the moment when it happened or the, the decade when it happened. Yes. Was this an answer? Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jörg, for this. And uh, uh, <clears throat> maybe are there any other, uh, there any other uh, questions yeah, by the students? Maybe I send for you. <laughs> Me? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, uh, I, I see that your, your portrait you, you give us about the, the relationship between uh, monumentality and documentality is very clear and it's very critical towards, as, uh, I would say, um, the, the nature of the, of the current practice of architecture, which uh, is something I, I agree if I look at the same things you're, you're showing us, for instance, those buildings by MVRDV and these other mm -hmm. things. I would even say that it is not, uh, that those artifacts are not so much about uh, architecture. <laughs> I mean, they're events somehow. Yeah. Maybe there have been exceptions also in the past, but in the past, in the recent past as well, uh, those kind of effects, they were, archi they were architectural effects. Mm. We were mentioning maybe, I don't know, the Seagram building or whatever. Mm. I mean, yes. um, uh, we had big uh, and monumental architecture uh, something relevant uh, emerging beyond something else, beyond the city or within in the middle of the city. Now maybe we, we should, I don't know, we could, we could look at, at the rest of the city more than th those uh, things, because they've become things. They've become something yes. like mm. I think my opinion is that that kind of uh, phenomena, which you also refer to a certain, yes, uh, uh, documental attitude of, mm -hmm. of automatism, of mechanism, uh, uh, works very well for those kind of objects because they're, they're almost object that you can sell and buy and move even. So that, that's the, there is an ontological reason for I don't consider them so much architecture. I'm exaggerating a little yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, instead, if they look at the right at the ninety percent of the rest of the city, the everyday practices of things mm -hmm. happening and rules and people negotiating and, and small houses or big houses or parks or even spared things, I, I see a lot of architecture, and mm -hmm. maybe it's, I don't know if it is monumental mm -hmm. in a wider sense. But it is architectural anyway. Yeah. And I think that in that situation where you don't have a con very controlled situation where you can apply the BIM system and everything is deterministic in the big data tools, mm -hmm. even now and even tomorrow, you won't be able to manage the city in this sense, the mm -hmm. ordinary city, yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless you don't pass through political means 
and human interactions. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? Well, you know, I'm happy that I showed you the last images, image and I did not talk about this. Yeah. This is Berlin, this is the situation in Berlin. And of course, this architecture is not made by big data. No, these are architects. Okay. But it looks like as if, you know, it, yeah. it is, it's stupid patterns, repetition, um, <clears throat> more or less that the, the apartments behind the facades are more or less the same. Um, they are not tailor made for, for yeah. people. And <clears throat> I have, you know, I, I, I fear um, that people, architects, also architects, that they internalize somehow this attitude mm -hmm. of the big data design and which is not only um, <clears throat> something which is part of the architecture world, but also in, you know, it, it, it affects all, all our culture. It affects the, the talking, the, the, the language. You know, the language is changing right now. Yeah. In a, you know, if you talk in a, you know, language becomes more and more um, primitive in a way, you know. I've, I have the feeling that if we go on like this, in a hundred years, nobody will be able to read Dante anymore or Goethe because we have unlearned the language and the complexity of the learned language. And probably the complexity will be then on a different field. And, and I, this is my fear that in architecture, similar things happens. And if I look, you know, the buildings which I showed that are very close to where I live here, it's north of the main station of Berlin. It's a huge area, yeah. <clears throat> area. and this is the architecture. And it's, you know, you can be desperate about these things. So the question is not whether big data is really applied to architecture. It will be in certain areas. But the problem is that our mind is being changed by this, by a new kind of thinking. And I would not even say that it's bad or better or worse. We don't know exactly. It might have also its advantages, advantages, but for the for the time being in the architecture, I think it does a lot of bad things. <laughs> I understand. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> there are other questions, maybe. Yeah, we have a uh, just last question from uh, the YouTube channel because there is someone that also is uh, mm -hmm. attending the conference from there. Is Fabrizia Mucci? Mm -hmm. And uh, she asked, uh, the, uh, does architecture have any have ethical implications regarding the way in which the, the data used in design is collected from people? Hmm. It's a good, it's a, it's a very dialectical uh, question because the ethical implications and how the data is of using the data and at the same time, the ethical implications of collecting data. And this is interesting. Um, yes, of course, right now we have this discussion about monitoring people staying at home when they caught the virus. So it's about collecting, it's, it's, it's exactly about this problem, uh, whether we can use this data, whether it's ethical, whether it interferes with the private atmosphere of people and so on, um, <clears throat> whether it is constitutional, for example, in dem democracies to really collect these data, but anyway, in the internet, the internet and those big companies, they collect data without any ethical um, <clears throat> background or consciousness. Um, it should be, yes, definitely. There should be ethics and ethics of collecting data and also protecting uh, protection and means to protect um, certain data from being, let me say, collected or stolen from people, definitively. I think this is a very important issue um, <clears throat> in, not only in the future, but already right now, yes. Uh, yes, Jorge, hello. La can I just make a quick remark related to what Alessandra was saying before? And maybe what is interesting is, um, 
is that big data, of course, works with the, with the big numbers, so with a the, with the large amount of numbers. And Alessandra was referring to the 90% of architecture in the city and not those single objects. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's interesting to, to, to see how big data actually works with the 90% of the objects, or mm -hmm. that is the essence of the big data. Big data works with the large amount of numbers of every person, not with a few big informations. So maybe this is also some, something interesting to work with, like the large amount of the architectures that happens and uh, with the large amount of information that deals with it, and not only with the single objects that work with a specific architectural style that is more related to this style that is happening today and is shared with all the architectures that you've, mm -hmm. you've, uh, you've shown. I don't know if this is clear. I don't know. It was just interesting remark to see the 90% and the big data. As, as an answer, I would say, I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, yes, I, I was more optimistic mm -hmm. in this sense because yeah. I, I, my 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 thought was uh, reversing this this as association between the big data and the ninety percent. I was saying that in the ninety percent of cases, when you try to do something in the real world, in material world, you have to to challenge a, a set of uh, obstacles of a. Uh, of uh, oppositions and resistances, mm -hmm. which are in the ordinary world, in the everyday practice, mm -hmm. are are not uh, under your control. Uh, what, uh, uh, but it, you can have these sets uh, and resistance under your control when you have a big work, when you have mm -hmm. a big thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you can isolate yourself in. Uh, uh, making your operation as something linear which optimizes everything according to a certain intention which is a, which is an autonomous intention and this autonomy is uh, against architecture because you cannot develop into a negotiating uh, process mm -hmm. what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, so th this was a, a sort of uh, reversing your the, the, the mm -hmm. problem so this, this is why we have to educate young architects you know not to become fantastic designers but independent thinking designers yeah. and if they are then they become excellent designers exactly. architects yeah. this is very important so it's about the humanistic basis of our profession of the culture and of course humanist <clears throat> humanism of course also changes because as I just pointed out with the um, Copernican revolutions, our idea of ourselves changes. But <clears throat> this doesn't mean that we have to stick to the concept of humanism of the 15th century, necessarily 100%. But of course, also this concept will change or adapt or bring certain aspects to the fore while others may be might be then less important. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as a matter of fact, this, this is important, yeah. I think. And this is important for education and in general, and you know, not only for the ed education in, in the university, but also for the architects as educator of the public. Maybe there's a, a further question for you, Jörg, coming from uh, the, the other channel, because you are um, you are, have a double channel transmission. So <laughs> from YouTube is coming from Marco. Maybe you can write it, uh, read it. Ah, yes, I read. I see it. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I read it. One question referring to the term documentality as pure presence in reality. As you said, documents always bring the topic of someone who write. In this case, the architect with his building and someone who read other architects or critics or people actually, yes, users. Um, don't you think that the, this crisis in searching the meaning of building is also based on the shift between those who build and those who study buildings giving to them a meaning? Are we in a time in which buildings are easier? Then, <clears throat> okay. Um, yes, I think, uh, yeah, what I wanted to point out is that with data-based design, if it goes towards this, 
that database design is not about only data, it's about technical, technological or material um, <clears throat> qualities, but the, the innovation in database um, thinking or intelligence, it, the data then reflect psychological, central, uh, personal things can be registered, analyzed, and then put into a scheme and then made to work. Um, <clears throat> and this, this is um, so, you know, so designing, so the designing will be a kind of custom made this, this design, something like this. But um, <clears throat> yeah, but there's already a split, I would say. <clears throat> um, but there was always a split between the ordinary, let's say, ordinary man on the street and the architect as a knowledgeable humanist um, person. I think this always existed. But there's a difference maybe today or in the recent past decades, starting with, modern, with modernity and the same situation, let's we go back two or 300 years back to classicism or Baroque architecture, what's saying. So the language of architecture, <clears throat> of classicist architecture is based on a very simple, I don't know, um, on a very, it's, it's a very simple visible language about what one imagines architecture is about. So it's about pressure, it's about posts and beams, very simple. And in the facade, it is expressed. So you have a classicist facade, but behind the facade, technically, structurally, the building works in a totally different way. Um, but it is a, a way to communicate. It's a kind of interface where architects, architecture communicates something to the user, which is not an educated architect, of course. And these person, people can then relate themselves to the building. Um, <clears throat> and it, so this is, this is the success of classicism, that it's so simple that it, you can understand it, that it has a simple, simple, how can I say, uh, message. Um, <clears throat> and it turns the complex architecture into simple, simply, simply to understand um, things. With, uh, with modern architecture, with what we call abstraction, um, I, you know, the, the language of architecture became more and more sophisticated in the sense that it was kind of also detached from the regular understanding of, of people, it became a kind of expert's um, knowledge and an expert's language. And this was one reaction, this is one, one critique of postmodernity towards modern architecture that architecture, there was nothing to understand, although architects would be easily, could be easily talk about hours about the nice design and where it comes from and how it, even the building like um, Mies van der Rohe's um, Farnsworth House, how it's connected to history and so on, but the ordinary people would not be able to follow this discourse. There is, there is this split, there was this split, um, and this is something we have to reflect about um, <clears throat> what the role of the architect is or whether the architect has to resist certain, a certain popularity of architecture, that it is also about holding up certain standards, so whether architecture is about education, I don't know exactly if this is the right word, but um, it's about standards and a more complex system of references of meaning, symbolic meaning, then um, so it's architecture as a challenge to the ordinary people, those people who use it. And I, I think sometimes I'm also an ordinary person using just architecture as it happens. I don't know whether this is an answer, but I think it's an interesting question which connects somehow the problem of big data design to the problem in architecture in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jörg. And I think uh, we have finished 
all the questions. Mm -hmm. Is I I ask for the last time. Is there any other question? Okay. Um, so, well, I would love to 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 thank you. I'm sorry, but I don't know why I cannot activate my camera. Uh, mm. And well, I think we 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 have another hundreds of uh, of questions for you, and we just as as uh, the team of the organizer, we really wanna thank you because of such a, th a theme that you bring uh, that you are bringing in in the Polytechnico, as data is influencing actually all our all all our environment social. Mm -hmm economical, political, and as architects, uh, we are one of the builder of the environment. So it, we are very heated by, by, this, by this theme. By building the environment, we build ourselves. <laughs> exactly, yes. And so uh, we wanna thank you and thank you all uh, the participants to, um, to the conference, to the lecture. And um, so we can declare close uh, our lecture with, uh, Jorge, and uh, uh, we will remember to you all that tomorrow we will have uh, uh, our seventh, uh, if I remember well, uh, ACC lecture uh, with, uh, with James Binning from the team of Assemble, and uh, we will be always at 1 p.m. And so see you tomorrow. And- uh, um, Thank you very much to everybody. I want to say hello to Jörg. I'm very glad to have Alexander. met you here again. I hope to meet you in person very, very soon <laughs> after all this. So, sì, yeah, yeah. Allora, abbiamo an sì. anche questi, questi piani, non so, di collaborazione. Eh, infatti, infatti, siamo... che in questo momento è un po' difficile, speriamo. Però... Tutto un po' in sospeso, però i nostri dottorandi anche poi verranno chiamati in causa. Su questa... e poi dobbiamo anche parlare di Ardet. E certo, perché poi appunto l'ultima cosa che non abbiamo neanche detto, la dico mm. in italiano, insomma, che non, abbiamo, non ho detto prima nella presentazione di Jörg è, è che sta curando il settimo numero di Ardet sul su tema dell'Europa e della, della costruzione dell'Europa come architettura continentale mm. in, tutti, in tutti i sensi, sia letterale, infrastrutturale che simbolico e quindi questo è un tema... Ormai la colla è chiusa, però stiamo raccogliendo, è quasi per essere chiusa in realtà, l'abbiamo posticipata, c'è ancora qualche mm. giorno e vedremo come, cosa, cosa ci rispondono. Ok, sì, sì. Perché, perché è un tema molto attuale in questo certo. momento. Adesso lo diventa ancora di più, abbiamo dovuto aggiornare la call perché no. era troppo attuale rispetto a quello che stava succedendo. Quindi... <ride> yeah. 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 Bello, okay. bello. Allora, io spero che ti potrei venire um, a Torino, non so, in un certo momento. Noi incrociamo le dita, anno. esatto, di poter, di poter mantenere quell'ipotesi di farti venire qui per una, un semestre. Sì, questo sarebbe bello, sì. Mm. Sarebbe molto bello per noi e anche per gli studenti, quindi speriamo mm. che riescano a, a godersi la tua venuta anche prossima. Allora, io preparo questa... Allora io lo, lo come si dice, verrà pubblicato anche a Volker Cuckoo, sai, ma Cloud Cuckoo, 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 something, uh, land, yeah? Cuckoo land. Um, questa è la mia idea adesso. Um, di, proprio, questa è una lezione, bisogna essere un po' più preciso. Um, Uh, trasformando questo testo in un testo scritto, poi forse lo possiamo fare, non so, distribuire anche agli studenti. Sì, sarebbe molto bello riprenderlo avendo, sotto, tu, avendo il testo in mano e entrando nel merito di molte questioni teoriche mm. importanti, anche con Maurizio. Noi abbiamo fatto mm. un seminario la settimana scorsa con lui, quindi figura. Mm. Su quei temi molto sì, molto vicini a quelli che hai toccato tu. Eh, sì, sì. Mm. Bene. Va bene, grazie ancora okay. allora. Jörg, a presto. Grazie a tutti voi e a presto. Okay. Ciao, a presto. Ciao. ciao.